Okay, Ephesians 5, 21 to 24. Submit to one another in fear of Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, he himself being savior of the body. <clears throat> but as the church submits to Christ, so also the wives are to submit to the husbands in everything. Now, verse 21, as I mentioned last week, it's a transition uh, to a discussion of the relationships in the ancient household. So he's going to discuss these husbands, wives, parents, children, masters, slaves. It could be understood as a continuation of, from verse 18, but with the standard editions of the Greek text, Nesselaland and UBS, I start a new paragraph here at 521. There are some other reasons for thinking that's the right way to go. Uh, so we have a new paragraph where he's turning his attention to these relationships in the ancient household. And Paul is urging Christians to submit to those to whom submission is due, the specific focus being on the need for wives to submit to their husbands, children to submit to their parents, and slaves to submit to their masters. <clears throat> now, as I noted last week, the, the word rendered submit, it doesn't mean to be humble or to act in a thoughtful, considerate, and serving way. However noble and grand those things are, that's not what the word submit means. It means to yield to the leadership right of another. Okay, so that's the, and I'm saying that because sometimes people look at this, they say submit to one another, and we get confused about this idea. Do you have some kind of rotating submission? And as I said last week, I think that's an incorrect way to understand it. Submission is yielding to the leadership right of another. He's speaking of the need to submit wives to husbands, children to parents, slaves to masters. Now, the husbands... The parents and the masters have duties. They're very important duties, and we'll talk about those, but I don't think those duties are properly understood as a duty to submit because that's not what the word means. Okay, it means to yield to a leadership right of another. You say, well, then how can it be called submitting to one another? Say, isn't, isn't reciprocity or a mutuality of submission inherent in this notion of to one another? And when we ended last week, or when I was so rudely interrupted by the bell, I was trying to point out that, uh, uh, you know, the answer is, is that the phrase, this pronoun that's translated to one another, it need not mean submission that is mutual or reciprocal, okay? It need not mean that. When you hear you say submit to one another, you think, okay, A to B, then B to A. But it can mean some within the group submitting to others within the group, and what I'm suggesting to you is he means wives to husbands, children to parents, slaves to masters. Okay, and you say, well, how, how do you think, why do you think it can mean some within a group submitting to others? Let me give you some examples where I think it'll be clear. Luke 2.15, it says, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. Now, some said of the shepherds said to the other of the shepherds, let's go to Bethlehem. It doesn't mean some said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that had happened, and they turned around and said back to them, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened. Some of them said it to others. Luke 12, 1, it tells of a crowd that's so large that they were trampling on one another. Okay, so it, it means that some trampled on others. It doesn't mean some trampled on others and those that were trampled on got up and trampled on the ones that had trampled on them. Okay, so you don't have this reciprocity or mutuality. Paul's command in Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 to bear one another's burdens. It doesn't mean that a person whose burdens were born, he must then turn around and bear the burdens of that person. You see, it means rather that, that some who were more able should help bear the burdens of others who were less able. Revelation 6 4 says men, men slay one another. Okay, it means that some men kill others. It doesn't mean that those who are killed then turn around and kill those who killed them. Okay, so I want you to see that, there, that this notion of reciprocity or mutuality, it's not inherent in the word. And I think the best way of understanding what he's saying is that submit to one another, meaning submit those, submit to whom submission is due, wives to husbands, parents, I mean children to parents, slaves to masters. Doesn't mean that there's not duties running the other way. Simply means that in my view that it is, you have to distort the word submit to turn it into this reversing kind of thing, A to B, B to A. Here's what uh, Peter O'Brien says. 
In the present context then, given that submit is one directional in its reference to submission to authority, and that the pronoun does not always indicate a symmetrical relationship, as I was trying to demonstrate, it's preferable to understand the clause submitting to one another to refer to submission to appropriate authorities, not mutual submission. Okay? Now, that doesn't take away from the responsibilities of husbands, the responsibilities of parents, or the responsibilities of masters. It's just saying that, look, it is not uh, the right way to see this as a reciprocal submission. Those duties are not properly characterized as submitting. And you say, well, wait a minute now. Uh, I think they are. Okay, if you think they are, then you still have to bring the difference in through the back door. Because you recognize that the duty that a parent owes to a child is different than the duty a child owes to a parent. And so what you wind up doing is you bring in the lack of reciprocity, the lack of mutuality, in the back door by saying, I now have two versions of submit. I have submit that means yield to the leadership right of another, and I have submit that means be kind and don't aggravate and all that. Okay, but you're bringing it in by distorting what submit means. Okay, maybe I spent too much time on that, but uh, before talking about the uh, submission of wives to husbands, certain things have to be understood. If these things aren't understood, you get a warped view. Okay, so let me run through some of the things that I think have to be nailed down when we talk about this. Men and women are created equally in the image of God, and together they comprise mankind. Okay, it's not like man's in the image of God, woman is not in the image of God. They are equally in the image of God, and it is together, male and female, that we have mankind. You see that in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, Genesis 5, 1 and 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 11 and 12, Paul points out that men and women are dependent on each other. Okay, we are dependent on one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 through 27, he makes clear that all who are in Christ are part of Christ's body and are equally precious, no second-class citizens in the body of Christ. Okay, all there, all equally precious. Peter describes husbands and wives as co-heirs, of the gracious gift of life in 1 Peter 3, 7. And in terms of one standing before God, Paul says in Galatians 3, 28, that there is neither male nor female in Christ Jesus. Okay, so you have to see something of the idea that we're not talking about status or value or anything. Made in the image of God, okay, just as much as men are, equally precious to God, co-heirs of the gift of life. And we have to get this through our head and understand it. Now, in the marriage partnership of two spiritually equal human beings, a man and a woman, you've got to say that these days, right? Mm -hmm. But in a, in a marriage partnership of two spiritually equal human beings, a man and a woman, the man bears the primary responsibility to lead the partnership in a God-glorifying direction. Okay, he is head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, God in his sovereignty, he bestowed on the husband the responsibility of headship or leadership. Now, I know that, you know, a lot of times women think that the burden of that deal is all on them, but I'm not going to launch into this, but leadership has its own burden, <laughs> okay? And a lot of times in our society, the biggest part of the problem is, is that the husbands won't carry the burden of leadership. You see, that's what happens. So I'm telling you, you know, there is a burden of leadership, and it's not all, the, you know, in the one who's supporting the leader. You say, well, I'm getting, you know, the raw end of the deal. There is a burden of leadership, and you can witness it in the fact that many men will not carry it out. They just don't want to be bothered. They want to retire. They're the caricature of the guy who's completely retired, just reads the paper, and just, you know, withdraws from the responsibilities of leadership. Okay, but God in his sovereignty has given the husband the responsibility of headship or leadership, and in doing so, and in calling the wife to accept her husband's leadership, God is not saying that the wife is inferior to, less worthy, or less capable than her husband. He is not saying in making that choice that the wife is inferior to, less worthy, or less capable than her husband. Husbands and wives simply have different roles or functions. 
They just have different roles or functions. Now we say, look, why? Why would God, why did God place the leadership responsibility exclusively on the husband and on the men in the spiritual family, the church? Why did he place that responsibility exclusively on the husband rather than letting the wife lead when she is the more or equally capable partner? Why not do it on the basis of leadership capability? Why do it on the basis of sex? He's the man, he's the husband, he's been... Why do it that way? That's our question. Why not do it on a way that you say, no, what we're going to do, whoever's the more, the more capable will lead. So we have that question. Now, one could just as well ask, you know, and the, the bottom line of that, by the way, we could look at, you know, well, Adam was created first and Eve came from Adam and all that. Where you ultimately get, though, when you track all that down, the bottom line is that God is sovereign and he chose to do it that way. That's where it stops. Now, maybe on that day we can ask him, what, what was the deal here? Okay, but he chose to do it that way. You know, one could just as well ask, well, why did God give the tribe of Levi the exclusive responsibility to care for the tabernacle? Or why did he give the family of Aaron the exclusive responsibility of serving as priests? Why limit those roles to people who happen to be born in a certain lineage rather than allowing everybody equal access to those roles? Listen, why do you want to have the tribe of Levi to care for the tabernacle? There are certainly other Jewish men who can lug furniture. They are capable of doing it. Well, why should you restrict it? See, that's the same issue that came up. People say, why do that? Okay, you could just as well ask that. That's precisely what led to Korah's rebellion. In Numbers chapter 16, right? You have Korah, who's a Levite, and 250 community leaders. They opposed Moses and Aaron on the basis that they should all have equal access to God. Look, all Israel's holy. That's the idea. They say all Israel is holy, so no one family line should be exalted to the priestly function. Look, what is this deal? We're all holy. What's this thing with the family of Aaron? What's that about? Okay, it was a challenge to God's right to choose select groups for specific roles. That was what they were challenging. We're all holy. We should all have equal access to the priesthood. Okay? You don't have a right, God, to pick certain lines of people, certain groups of people for specific roles. And you know what? how that turned out. Right? Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were swallowed by the earth. The 250 community leaders were incinerated. God did not take kindly to this attitude that says to God, you do not have the right to choose specific groups of people for certain roles. He does. And he has chosen to put the leadership responsibility on men. And it is a responsibility. In doing that, he's not saying, like when the tribe of Levi, he's not saying, I don't think somebody from the tribe of Benjamin, is in, they, they can't carry furniture. They're too stupid or not strong enough. He's not saying that. He's saying, I have made a choice for my reasons, and I've placed this burden on the husband to lead. Okay, so I want you to see this, that this is, our culture has pumped this idea out there that says, listen, uh, if you're not also, if you're not leading, then somehow it's, you're, you're being uh, slighted. You're not, the, the message is, is that you're unworthy, you're second rate, you're not able to do it. That's not what it's about. It's about God and his sovereignty assigning leadership responsibility. Now understand that a submissive or non-leading role does not mean an inferior status. Okay, women, listen to me. I know this is not the message that you hear in our society, but having a, a, a submissive or non-leading role, it does not mean an inferior status. Jesus is God. Okay, he is God. This is standard Orthodox Trinitarian theology. Jesus is God. He is one. In nature, being, and essence with God the Father. So the Son is not inferior to or less worthy than the Father in the least. He's one in nature, being, and essence with the Father. 
He's not inferior to or less worthy than the Father, and yet he is functionally subordinate to the Father. He willingly submits to the Father's authority. That's made explicit in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 27 and 28. But you also see his functional subordination. You see it in a number of facts. Okay, I'm not going to cite all the texts that I have written down here to support each of these things. You'll know that they're right when I say them. But Jesus, he was sent by the Father. Right? He was sent by the Father. He he spoke the words of the Father. He came to do the Father's will. He revealed the Father. He seeks to please, glorify, and honor the Father. He judges only as he hears from the Father. Okay, so do you see this idea? There is a functional subordination, though he is one in essence, nature, and being with God the Father. He is not the least bit less than or inferior to God the Father. Now, if he being in very nature God can submit to the Father's authority, then certainly a wife can submit to her husband's leadership without denying her equal dignity and value. She's acting like Christ when she does that. Okay, you're not denying her equal dignity and value despite what our culture sells to you. So you can't hold your head up. You sit there and say, well, no, I think, that you, I think that a wife ought to submit to her husband. Ladies, how many of you would say that in a group of women without hanging your head and going, oh, I feel sorry about that. I, I don't, they won't think I'm really, I'm really intelligent. They'll think I'm just, you know, You see, but but why is that? It is because we have been fed this idea that somehow that would make you inferior to, less worthy, less capable, and all of that's nonsense. It is because God has given a different role to you. That's what it's about. Now, Paul, he says that, that why, and I say, you see that parallel, by the way. When I say that she's acting like Christ, you see that parallel is specifically drawn in 1 Corinthians 11, 3. God, the head of the, father, head of the son, as husband, head of the wife, You see the same idea drawn there specifically. So I say they're acting like Christ. Wives, when you do that, make no apology for it. Just teach people how to understand it. Okay, now Paul, he he says that wives are to submit to their own husbands as to the Lord. That'll have you scratching your head. That does not mean, okay, that, that a wife is to submit to her husband as though he were Christ. That would be something, wouldn't it? As though he were Christ, you see, submission to Christ is expressed in unquestioning obedience because he's God. Right? He's God. He is the holy, perfect, infallible creator and savior. There can be no justification, okay, for trying to uh, enlighten him or question his will or probe him or anything. He's God. So all you do for him is there's unquestioning obedience to him because he's infallible. You don't treat a husband that way, because if you do, you're not fulfilling your duties to him. I'll say something about that in a second. Oh, so, see, so there's a difference, you see, that there, when it talks about you don't submit to him as though he were Christ, he is perfect, there's no justification for questioning his will or attempting to enlighten him, because he's God. Husbands, on the other hand, and this is going to come as a shock to you ladies, I'm sure, you know, we are limited sinful human beings. Unlike the Lord, you see, we can make very foolish and even sinful choices. Okay, so it can't mean that when you say, follow him as though we're Christ, just whatever he says, that's right. Because we can make sinful choices. See, submission to husbands, it's expressed in supporting their non-sinful decisions Not because of husbands' inherent qualities. Not because of who they are. Okay? It is because God has given the responsibility of leadership in the family to the husband. The wife is to submit to the husband, quote, as to the Lord, end quote, in that when the husband has finally chosen a course of action, when he's finally made that decision, the wife willingly supports and follows that choice. Not resenting it. Not grudgingly. That's not how we follow Christ. It is as to the Lord in that sense. She doesn't resent it. She doesn't seek to sabotage it. She doesn't try to undermine it. She says, because I disagreed with you on this, I'm going to show you your move was stupid. 
And I'm going to do everything I can to destroy it. That's not how we serve Christ. You see, that's not how we serve Christ. Of course, if a husband chooses a sinful course of action, the wife can't support it. Right? Hey, babe, let's go rob a bank. Well, then the wife doesn't sit there and go, yes, dear. Whatever you say, dear. Okay, the husband's authority is from the Lord. He has no authority to push one of Christ's disciples into sin. Okay, no authority to do that. To follow one's husband into sin is not a submission that is fitting in the Lord, to use the words from Colossians 3.18. You see, that wouldn't be fitting in the Lord. So she obviously doesn't follow the, non, doesn't follow the husband in sinful decisions. Now, unlike the situation in submitting to Christ, the wife must help her husband in the discharge of his leadership responsibility. Right? She is called to use her gifts, to use her talents, to bless her husband and the family. Okay, so she must, it is, it is her responsibility to help her husband in the discharge of his leadership responsibility. And that often requires her to inform, to question, to advise, and to correct her husband. What kind of a wife would it be when she knows her husband is being a bonehead factually about something? He says, well, hey, the interest rate on this is 80%. She's reading and says, you're crazy. There's a decimal point you're missing. Now, what kind of a wife wouldn't say, dear, you're ill-informed? Okay, I mean, nobody, you wouldn't expect anybody who cared about you to let you go on and stumbling around under mistaken impressions and false ideas and all that. Okay, so this idea of submission, the way it's caricatured in our godless society, they sit there and say, well, yeah, yeah, you know, this stuff about women's, I can't put up with that. You're saying I'm inferior. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you've been called to a different role, okay? And so the caricature is, of in, here's the Christian wife in our culture's caricature. She just sits over in the, sh, in, in the corner and just sh, sitting here and shuddering, just going, every now and then she'll say, yes, oh, great one. Yes, oh, great one. Okay, well, that, I'm telling you, if that's happening, then the wife's not doing her role in trying to bless her husband. She ought to be saying, no, hey, you know, this is a better idea. Think about this. Think about that. They're partners. Right? They're partners. And she has a responsibility there to use her gifts and abilities to bless the husband and her family. Now, in a healthy marriage, in a healthy marriage, a husband and wife can almost always, maybe even always, but at least almost always come to a consensus on what course of action should be taken. Okay, that's just how it is. Okay, but maybe there are times when there's not enough time available or something where they cannot come to a mutual understanding of how we as a family should proceed. Now, in those situations where a mutual decision can't be reached, the wife is called by God to yield to her husband's decision. Okay, and I think James Hurley, uh, probably, I guess, 28 years ago now, in his book, Man and Woman in Biblical Perspective, I think he captures beautifully the spirit with which those kinds of situations need to be handled. The the spirit with which those kinds of decisions are to be made. Let me read to you a a quote from, from that book. He says, the manner in which such decisions are handled is crucial. See, this is in that rare instance where you either don't have time, you can't come to the one mind on the thing. Okay, he says, the manner in which such decisions are handled is crucial. The husband may not be high-handed and stubborn knowing that she will finally have to give way. You see this idea, hey, what do I care? Just shut up. You know, it's on me, babe. I'm not listening to you. What do I care? Uh, you know, I'm the smartest thing that ever happened. You know, you never had a good thought in your life. Okay, none of that. Okay, none of that. All right, he says, knowing she'll finally have to give way can't be that way. That's not the model of Christ's headship. Neither may the wife be grudging and resentful. That's not the manner of our response to Christ. In the last analysis, when the two can devote no more time to individual and joint seeking of the grace of God to permit them to come to one mind or to be willing to yield to the other and exchange along the following lines is in order. 
Husband, not because I am inherently wiser or more righteous, nor because I am right, although I do believe I am or I would not stand firm, but because it's finally my responsibility before God, we will take the course which I believe is right. If I am being sinfully stubborn, may God forgive me and give me the grace to yield to you. Wife, not because I believe you are wiser in this matter, I don't, or more righteous, nor because I accept that you're right, because I don't or I would not oppose you, but because I am a servant of God who has called me to honor your headship, I willingly yield to your decision. If I am wrong, may God show me. If you are wrong, may he give you grace to acknowledge it and to change. Now, see, I think this captures the spirit. Do you see? There's none of this stuff about, woman, you know who I am? I mean, the problem is she does know who I am. Okay? There is none of that. Do you see? that This idea is all gone. There are two different roles where the, the family... The, the husband is given the responsibility to lead the partnership in God-glorifying directions, and he and his wife work together, but they do so under the acknowledgement that, listen, ultimately, God has called you to lead, okay? It's ultimately your call, and I will support you in it, okay? I will do all I can to help you see when I think you're wrong. I will try to enlighten you because we can be wrong. That's what I'm telling you. That's the difference. Christ can't be wrong. We can be crazy. Right? We can just be off the deep end. And we need somebody to say, anybody been married for a while, you understand. Okay? You understand what I'm talking about. Right? He's the first person you'll go to and ask if you're going to do anything, present anything. I'm going to send anything. I'll call Megan. i say, what do you think of this? I want to know what she thinks about it. Now, he, he says here, he himself being savior of the body, but as the church submits to Christ, so also the wives are to submit to husbands and everything. It's true that Christ is savior of the body, unlike the husband in relation to the wife, but despite that difference, that he's not the savior, as Christ is the savior of the body, wives are to submit to their husbands and everything just as the church does to Christ. Now, I've only got 15 minutes. We're going to talk about the husbands, Okay. Because though I don't think that it is not right to speak of their duty as submission, this is the part that everybody likes to slide over and hide and portray Christians as, you know, it's just terrible. You know, these Christian men, you know, and it just kills me. It ought to be the case that every woman would want a Christian husband. That ought to be how it is. Not this idea that you sit here and say, I don't want to have this guy. He's a nut who thinks that I just stand around to buff his shoes and cook. Okay? He says, husbands, uh, 525, husbands love the wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, cleansing her by the washing of the water with a word, that he might present the church to himself as glorious without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but in order that she might be holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ also does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two be will become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and to the church in any case, you also, one by one, let each love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she fears the husband. Okay, Paul, now he directs his attention here. Now, given the exhortation of wives to submit to the husbands, a first century reader probably expected Paul to tell the husbands to rule their wives. Okay, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, rule your wives. But what does he tell the husbands? Love your wives. Okay, he tells them to love, love the wives. He commands them. He commands them to love their wives. Now, love is an, it is an, essential, is an essential quality in the life of all Christians. You see that in chapter 1, 3, 4, throughout the New Testament. Okay, love is an essential quality in the life of Christians. But here it's specifically required of husbands in relation to their wives. Now, the very fact he commands it 
The very fact he commands them to love their wives shows that it involves an act of will. Biblical love is not infatuation. This is why I have little patience with people. I have little patience with a lot of things, which is not my strong suit. Okay, but why have little patience with people who take a spouse and then wind up saying, well, I just didn't love you. Here's the door. You don't know what love is. See, it's not infatuation. That's not what biblical love is about. It's not some kind of deal where you just sit here and say, listen, oh, you know, we're, we're just going through the lilies and music is playing. Oh. That's not what biblical love is about. It's not infatuation. It is a self-giving commitment to another person's welfare. It is a self-giving, a sacrificial giving to another person's welfare. That's the bond you make when you look at that woman on that up there getting ready to get married and you say, I do. I'm giving my life to you and I'm going to serve you and bless you. And that's what I'm doing. I'm choosing to love you. As we say, till death do us part were it only so. Right? Right? Were it only so. That's not how we play it. But that's what biblical love is. It is a commitment to the welfare of another person. Of course, in marriage, this love exists in a context of natural affection and sexual intimacy. Okay, I understand that. But you can't miss that he's commanding them to love their wives. And the model for this love is Christ's love for the church. The husband is to view his relationship with his submissive wife not in terms of what he can demand from her. He sits there and says, hey, listen, this Christian thing is really cool. Look, I'm the head of the household. Now watch, I get to extract stuff from her. I get to demand from her. That's what I want. It's not that way. See, he views it not in terms of what he can demand from her, but in terms of how he can give to her. Husbands, this is you. It's how can you give to your wife? It's not how can you pull from her. How can you give to her? How can you bless her? How can you be an instrument of God's blessing in her life? That is your function. That is your role in this relationship. You are to sacrifice for her genuine welfare. There is no sacrifice you're not willing to make for her welfare. Now, if people live that, if we, husbands, acted that, do you think that, the, that you'd have this? Of course, you probably would, because I think demonic stuff is at work in lying about the church. But don't you think it would help? Don't you think it would help marriages if we lived that, if we understood that? See, not to, husbands are not to seek to harm or to exploit their wives. Right? I mean... You don't seek, that's not what you're doing. You're seeking to bless your wife as a conduit of God's blessing. Husband's commit, commitment to his wife is so great. No sacrifice he's unwilling to make for her genuine welfare. I mean, Christ gave himself up on a cross for the church. And what does he say? Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. That puts it in a different perspective, doesn't it? What kind of love did he have for the, for the church, for the, the lost, the world? What did he do? He died for it. Now, will you go out of your way at all to bless your wife? Will you give to your wife? Will you sacrifice for your wife to bless her? That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do. And we got to take it seriously. And I think if we took it seriously, there'd be a lot less stuff with divorce Okay, a lot less if we would take this stuff seriously instead of saying, I've heard it all my life. Nobody can teach me anything. Listen to what he's saying about husbands and wives and tell me this would not transform marital relationships. It would absolutely do it. Now, having spoken of Christ's love for the church, he elaborates on its purpose. He's going to elaborate on the purpose of Christ's love for the church, not intending this as part of the husband's responsibility for his wife. He's elaborating on the purpose of Christ's love for the church. That love is, exp ex is supremely expressed in Christ's death. 
Okay, and he says, what is the purpose of that love? First was to sanctify her. The purpose of Christ's love for the church was to sanctify her. That, this means to consecrate her to God, to set her apart for a special relationship with him. Ernest Best says in his commentary, those whom God sanctifies are separated from the secular sphere and brought within that of his holiness and are therefore acceptable to him. And this sanctification, this was, of course, it was achieved by, by Christ's sacrifice on the cross, the cleansing effect of which is appropriated by the washing of the water with the word. See, where is this, this, this sanctifying? It is accomplished in his death. It is appropriated, cleansing her by the washing of the water with the word. Now, this almost certainly is a reference to baptism. Okay, it is almost certainly a reference to baptism, and it's understood as such by the vast majority of commentators. This isn't some deal, well, you know, that's an idiosyncratic view of you uh, people from the Restoration Movement. You know, you get hung up and you see baptism everywhere. I see it here, and I'm not the Lone Ranger. Okay? Almost everybody sees it here. Let me read to you a quote from a Marcus Bart. Marcus Bart, a big-time uh, New Testament theologian, he wrote a two-volume commentary in the Anchor Bible series in, in the mid-70s, uh, a two-volume commentary on Ephesians. And he says, Practically all interpreters in the East and West, in ancient, medieval, Reformation, and modern times, agree in interpreting Ephesians 5.26 as a reference to baptism. So I make no apology for that. <laughs> you know, it's not like, well, you know, that's really great scripture twisting you're doing. No. It's right in line with the big stream of scholarship. So who is it who's dancing around it? Well, it's those few people that say, nah, nah. You don't want to look and find baptism here. Washing of the water with a word. Don't want to find that there. I, I, will, I will spare you the names of the, some of the modern commentators who recognize that this is a reference to baptism. One of them, though, is Ernest Best, who says, as soon as the readers began to believe and were baptized, they were saints, that is, sanctified. Sanctification and baptism are connected in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, a connection brought out later in our verse. So he says, with the washing of the water, with the word, with the word is, is either the confession of the baptized person, see, which is what, what, what has been done. You come here and you confess your faith. It's either a reference to the confession of the baptized person or the formula that were, was pronounced by the baptizer. Baptize your name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, name of Jesus. You see, so one of, those, one of those is the more likely. Now, there's a less likely possibility that, that, uh, to take by the word with cleansing, so you get cleansing by the word through the washing in water, and then it would be a reference to the gospel message, the response to which would be baptism. Okay, but I think the first uh, two are, are, are more likely. Now, this allusion to baptism... It's particularly appropriate here in light of the imagery that Paul is employing. Okay, this bridal imagery that he's using. Jewish marital custom, it employed, it used a prenuptial bath. Okay, that was part of Jewish marital custom. And the marital imagery in Ezekiel 16, 8 through 14, it refers to God washing his bride. Okay, so you see how, how perfectly this fits, this idea. You know, he's taking this imagery and employing it here. Now, so he first says, look, the purpose of this love, supremely expressed in his death, was to sanctify her. Secondly, was to present the church to himself as glorious without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And here we have the bridal imagery now is coming to the fore. Christ died to make the church fit for him as a bride. Her splendor is not flawed by any physical defect, spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. And you see immediately see that these physical defects of the bride, it's metaphorical imagery that he's using for her holiness. See, for her purity, for her being holy and blameless. That's the third purpose, you see, to make the church holy and blameless. All right, purity is the distinguishing mark of the church that Christ died to form. Okay, purity. Holy and blameless. And as I, as I said in chapter 1, verse 4, we are now without fault or blemish, not in ourselves, but because God in His grace is what? He's made us that way. 
See, He has in His grace made us without fault or blemish and will be declared as such when we're presented before Him on that day. We will be declared as without fault or blemish. And on that day, at the consummation of the kingdom, our transformation into His image will be completed so that we will then be in nature and practice what we have been by God's merciful decree. Our sanctification will be completed then. You see, so we are holy and blameless by God's mercy and grace. And on that day, we will be transformed. Our our change will be finalized or finished. And then we'll be in nature and practice what we have been by His grace. See, so Christ, this purpose of his love is to do these things, to sanctify her, to present the church to himself as glorious without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, and to make the church holy and blameless. Then he says, in the same way as Christ, okay, who loves the church as his body, in the same way as Christ, he loves the church as his body, in the same way he loves the church, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Husbands, you know what weenies we are. Sick, hurt, you know, always complaining, you know. It hurts, baby. Can you do something for me? Right? We definitely love our bodies. Well, he's saying, listen, of course, everybody does. And he's saying, this is the idea. Do you see this connection? In the same way as Christ, who loves the church as his body, you ought to love your wives as your own bodies. Just as the husband cares for his body's needs, so his love for his wife should be of the sort that cares for her needs and facilitates her growth and development. Cares for her needs and facilitates her growth and development. Husbands and wives, say, I don't care about her. You know, she, I don't care about her. What are you reading? What are you reading? You have to care about her. You have to care about her needs. You have to care about her growth and development. You have to be willing to sacrifice to bless her. Right? We're followers of Christ, right? All right. In for a penny, baby. In for a pound. It's sitting right there. This is how we're to be. This is how we're to be. That is the target. That is the target. And we are to shoot for it. Okay, this makes perfect sense. Husband is to, is to care for her needs, uh, facilitate her growth and development. This makes perfect sense. See, given that the husband and wife are what? They're one flesh. Genesis 2.24. So he's to care for her as he cares for his own body. And I'm just saying, it'll revolutionize the relationship. I suspect many wives of Christians would say, My husband's never read this. He doesn't act this way toward me. Well, brothers, we need to. We need to. And if we haven't, we need to repent. We need to say, okay, thank you for your mercy, but from this day on, I'm going to seek to put that into practice. I'm going to seek to bless my wife and to be a vehicle in her life of God's blessing. I will pass God's blessing to her So that when she's asked about me in her life, she thanks God that I'm in her life because I am a conduit for his blessings in hers. Thank you. Be gone next week. Merry Christmas to all of you.